Hi, I'm Brian Mallow, and this interview is part of a series that I'm producing in partnership with Sigma Xi, the Scientific Research Honor Society, in order to bring you up-to-date, research-based information about the current COVID-19 outbreak. So it's my pleasure today to be speaking to Dr. Ann Skalka. She is a professor emerita at the Fox Chase Cancer Center in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And she also literally wrote the book on viruses, or at least co-authored a textbook that's been used in universities for over 20 years, as, as well as a book that's more for the informed layperson called Discovering Retroviruses. So Anne, thank you very much for joining me. My pleasure. <laughs> and since this is for Sigma Xi, I understand very recently in 2018, you were awarded the William Proctor Prize for Scientific Achievement um, yes. from Sigma Xi. What was that award for? Uh, it was Scientific Achievement, and it was uh, really exciting for me, and I had a great time there. And I actually gave a talk. Uh, they have a session at the end where they have students from all over, and I gave a talk on viruses. So it was um, it was lots of fun, and uh, they all seemed to enjoy it. And of course, I focused on my retroviruses. I know that part of the award is also for sort of public communication of science. In the case of Sigma Xi, Sigma Xi is a scientific research honor society across all disciplines. And the magazine they publish, um, American Scientist, is, it's my understanding that a lot of it is to bring really up-to-date research to scientists and make it explainable to other scientists outside one's own discipline. So um, Sigma Xi wants the public to be informed, but they also want other scientists to be informed uh, and up to date about breakthroughs in completely other fields. So is that that public understanding of science and the sharing of the information outside of your peer reviewed research, has that been important to you? It has been, yes. Um, and I really enjoyed the sessions there for that reason. I've always made it a point actually to try to go to seminars that were a little bit out of my comfort area because we, you find so many interesting things and some of them just astoundingly come to be very relevant and uh, give you come new ideas. So it's, uh, it's a good thing to do. And I think uh, uh, the uh, magazine of Sigma Xi is a, is a great way to do that. Yeah, I love that idea of that, that cross-pollination yeah. amongst other scientists, whether it's something just a little distant from your field or even something dramatically distant. Do you happen to have an example of something that uh, that you picked up like that, that you may not have otherwise? Oh, yes, I do. I do. Uh, and I gave that example, actually, at my little talk. Um, so I was studying retroviruses at the time, and people were purifying these particles and trying to get inside of them to see what they could do, what the enzymes could be active. And uh, they, they used a uh, non-ionic detergent to kind of disrupt the outside. And that worked, but it was, uh, was pretty inefficient. And one day I went to a seminar, it was a person studying membranes and, and that sort of thing. And I learned about um, a protein called melatonin. And melatonin is, um, it's the major protein, a major toxin in bee venom. So when a bee stings you, you feel melatonin. And it's a tiny little protein, and it has this wonderful capacity to intercalate, stick itself into membranes. So it pokes kind of holes. And I thought, oh, light bulb, light bulb. Maybe this melatonin could penetrate a little virus particles and allow us to see what's inside better or measure the enzymes better. And it worked like magic. It really did. So I, I got some melatonin. My, one of my postdoctoral associates tried it. And it was, uh, it was wonderful. It was a big breakthrough for us. And I think for the community as well. That is excellent. You know, I love, I'm not a scientist and I love uh, listening to scientists, uh, especially when they get excited talking about whatever their field is. And I wonder, did you always know that you wanted to be a scientist? And if so, did you always know that you wanted to go into this sort of field? How did you 
get hooked up in uh, in this subject of viruses? Well, um, I always liked biology. I liked going on walks and looking at the animals when I was a kid. Uh, my dad worked for Charles Pfizer. And um, so I got early into labs because they had a policy of letting um, the children of people who work there do summer jobs. So I had took a summer job in the lab and I found it was a lot of fun. Uh, the reason I got hooked on viruses was when I was in um, an undergraduate, we took a, I took a course in biochemistry. And this was just really after, um, after Watson and Crick had discovered DNA. And it was just four years after that. And we made DNA. And I spooled this DNA out and it was, I was just fascinated. You could actually look at and see the stuff of genes. It was extraordinary. So if you're a geneticist or if you wanted to study DNA and genes and what they did at the time, the best, the best uh, experimental systems were viruses because they're tiny and their genomes are tiny. So you could hope to actually understand their genes and what they did. Uh, and that's how I got into virology, actually. So tell me, what, uh, what is your definition of a virus? Um, but more than your definition, what do you find fascinating about them? Uh, you know, I find them fascinating uh, in a couple of ways. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, they're little packets of genetic information. They can't do anything by themselves. They're just these little packets that are wrapped up in a, in a, a protein and sometimes also a membrane. And they, they're just uh, inert by themselves. They can't do anything until they get inside of a cell. And there, much like a computer virus, uh, they have the genetic information to take over the whole system and tell the system, make more of me. And they do that, and they do that in a different way than uh, most biological cells or entities uh, duplicate. They don't just make one makes two and two makes four and so forth and so on. They completely disintegrate when they go into a cell. And uh, their genetic information just programs the cell to make all of these components that know by themselves to get together and make another particle. It's fascinating. And it tells you a lot, not only about the viruses, but about cell systems. I mean, if they have to, if they have to commandeer the cell, if you understand how they do that, then you understand how the cell does it normally. So they give you information, not only about themselves, but at the cell of, about the cells that they infect. And there's such a fascinating topic that you, I also, I, I recently interviewed Dr. Mark Peoples and he's been studying the same virus, RSV, for 46 years. Yes. Um, I think it's fascinating that, how, that, that you could pick a field like this and stay interested in it uh, as well, I, I'm sure, for this many decades, right? <laughs> yes, yes. But I didn't start studying retroviruses. I started studying viruses that infect bacteria mm. because at the time, which was in the uh, early, late 60s, uh, we didn't know how to culture cells of uh, uh, eukaryotic cells very well, but we knew how to culture bacteria very well. And uh, so it was a very simple system. You could grow the cells overnight and infect them with the, with the uh, bacteriophages. And uh, you could learn an awful lot. And that was a, a kind of golden area of uh, phage genetics. And there was a group that was called the phage group that worked closely together to kind of understand genetics and, and how, how bacteriophages actually worked. Interesting. Before I ask you about your area of specialty, retroviruses. Yes. Um, just viruses in general. Could you tell me something? People tend to think of viruses and bacteria. Uh, they have this narrow view of their germs that are bad for humans. But that is such a narrow picture of what a virus actually is, right? That's correct, yes. So viruses are uh, the most numerous entities 
uh, in the globe. And uh, they are absolutely essential for our ecology. Um, so in our textbook, and for example, we point out that um, viruses in the ocean are 100 times more uh, copious than the bacteria and the other organisms. And they play an essential role because uh, what they do is attack the bacteria, releasing all of the uh, internal parts of the bacteria into the environment. And they uh, produce all of the uh, different kinds of material that are necessary for other life forms. So they're absolutely essential. And uh, let's see, in uh, I think, was it a teaspoon of seawater, there are something like uh, 10 to the nine phage particles or bac bacterial viruses. Uh, it's, it's just an enormous number. And uh, the other, the other uh, information that uh, I think that uh, the other interesting point is that if you hook them all up to next to each other, they would go to the sun and back numerous times. I mean, it's just enormous. Uh, their mass is more than all the elephants on the earth. So despite the tiny size. So they're really absolutely important. They're important in the soil as well for the same reason. They attack bacteria in the soil, releasing all of the uh, uh, nutrients. Uh, they're not just bad for us. They're also good for us. It's a yin and yang. <laughs> yeah. Do you have a favorite virus? Yes, my favorite virus is the retroviruses, and I have been studying for years uh, the retrovirus, a retrovirus that infects chickens. It's called the Rouse sarcoma virus. It was discovered by Peyton Rouse in, uh, I think it was 1911. It was the first virus that uh, was found to cause a solid tumor, and um People didn't believe him at all, and uh, uh, he kind of got so discouraged uh, that he went on to other fields. But finally, when he was 88 years old or something like that, they, he got a Nobel Prize for the discovery of the Rouse sarcoma virus because it had been, uh, through the years, uh, through the 70s, 60s, and 70s, one of the main um, research tools that we used for studying cancer. Interesting. So... Uh... Let me ask you, what is a retrovirus and what makes it distinct from other types of viruses? So uh, retro, uh, so let me start by saying that retroviruses uh, and viruses in general are unique in that uh, they come in mostly two flavors. Uh, there are those that have genomes that are made up of DNA, like everything else in the universe or in the, in the world anyway. And then there are a few that are made of, their genomes are made of RNA. And viruses are the only entities, or the only biological entities that have RNA genomes. So they're thought to be remnants of that earlier world in which RNA genomes were the most important ones, but there they are. So there are there's two flavors, the DNA and the RNA. So retroviruses have RNA genomes, but they have the ability when they infect a cell to make a DNA copy of themselves. And then they have an enzyme which gets, takes that DNA copy and inserts it into the genome of the cell that it infects. It really takes over the genome. It becomes a part of it. And uh, they are uh, special in that regard. As you were describing them, like their simplicity and the fact that they're uh, all viruses aren't RNA based, are they? No, no, okay. they're a DNA based and they're RNA. So there are two flavors, <laughs> as I said. Okay. Some of them are DNA based and some of them are RNA based. So. And retroviruses are RNA based. Correct. And that's what the retro part means. It's like because they, rather than taking their DNA and making RNA inside the cell, they do the opposite of that. And that's the yes. retro. Yes. Um, okay. So because of their simplicity, 
what do we know about the evolution of viruses originally? Um, did viruses come first? But if they came first, they require a cell to reproduce. So what do we even know about the evolution of life and the evolution of viruses? Anything? Well, uh, it's still a pretty big mystery, but uh, most scientists agree that um, uh, the first genomes uh, in Earth during evolution were probably made of RNA. And um, the RNA then found a way to kind of duplicate itself because RNA can also, in certain instances, uh, work as an enzyme. So the RNA duplicated itself. And so we think that the first world was an RNA world. Whether there were cells there or not, they might have been, just been RNA kind of duplicating itself in a little soup or something. And then they may have, they may have been amino acids around and they might have used some amino acids. So you got some protein there. Um, and then there's a big gap because uh, we now know that all other life forms, all, all firm life forms on Earth have DNA. So how we got from RNA to DNA is not known. But if you think about it, you need would need a, a an enzyme that could do that, right? It could make DNA from RNA, and that's what retroviruses do. So retrovirus is a kind of a a, a peephole into into initial evolution, I think. Is this part of the distinction between retroviruses and other viruses that the retrovirus makes that DNA and actually inserts it into the genome of a cell? Does that mean it, it becomes permanently part of that genome? It's permanently part of that genome forever. And... Uh... The human genome has uh, evidence that that happened uh, many, many times in evolution because 8% of our genome comprises ancient retroviruses that got stuck there, uh, probably in one of our early ancestors' uh, uh, germline cells, sperm or egg, and persists to this day. And... Um, it's really fascinating to, to think about it because the amount of genetic information that comprises retroviruses is more than the genetic in, information that you need to make all the proteins in your body. So in a sense, we're more retroviruses than we are human. <laughs> it's kind of bizarre. But the other important thing is that evolution has found a way to use some of the proteins from the retroviruses in very practical ways. So um, they're, they, they've gotten there, they may have caused a disease or may not in the, in the, in the, uh, when they first were in, in, inserted. Uh, but uh, those that are there now are mostly inactive, but parts of them are still very functional in terms of uh, requirements for our own physiology. Can you give me an example? Is there some known important gene that we know is traceable to having been injected by a, a, an ancient virus? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, if it weren't for retroviruses, uh, human beings might be producing their young and eggs because <laughs> there is a protein uh, in, the, in the placenta called syncytion, which is necessary to make the placenta, which is a... a uh, a protective uh, organ that protects the embryo from the mother and the mother from the embryo. And uh, it's formed by cell fusion, fusions of cells. So it's a big, it's a one vast big fusion of cells. And uh, syncytion is a protein that uh, does that fusion. And that is a protein that's derived from a retrovirus because retroviruses, when they enter cells, they have to fuse themselves with the outer membrane of a cell. So they have that special fusion protein, and uh, that has been used in evolution uh, um, millions of years ago at the, at the origin of the formation of placental uh, mammals. 
and uh, it's been used, uh, it's been exploited in humans and separately in other other kinds of uh, other animals, or other mammals. So they use, they don't use the same retrovirus, but they use retroviruses to make their placenta. Interesting. I, I find that fascinating. And for, I'm a non-scientist, so when I ask this, uh, can you tell me something about, how can we actually tell that that gene didn't just evolve in the human species or in the mammalian line? Um, how do we know that it was inserted by a retro, by, by a, an old retrovirus? Well, retroviruses, we know what, what a retrovirus looks like when it's inserted because it has, it has um, uh, telltale uh, 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 features of it. So it has uh, two long terminal repeats at the end. It has uh, definable genes that even although they're not functional, you can see the genes that are necessary to make uh, the, uh, the outer uh, envelope and the genes that are uh, necessary to make that capsid that encloses the genome. So you can recognize a retrovirus. And what happened was people were kind of looking for enzymes in the, in the uh, placenta, for example, uh, or proteins in the placenta. And then they found one and they sequenced it. They knew what the sequence was. And they said, well, where does it come from? And they looked into the genome and there it was. It was actually the envelope gene of a retrovirus. Uh, it was, it's absolutely amazing. That is fascinating. Um... It's amazing to me, they're so simple and their behaviors are so elaborate. Um, and not to mention the sort of David and Goliath aspect of something so very tiny, mostly so much smaller than even a bacteria can affect such a large creature to the point of yes. shutting down systems or killing it. Yes, 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 it, they, they are. They do, they do a lot. Uh, and it's not intentional, you know, it's, uh, it's just part of their reproduction. And uh, uh, we are collateral damage when it, there's a disease. You mentioned something about uh, the percentage of our genome that actually is traceable to retroviruses. And our genome, only a small percentage of the entire human genome is actually genes that encode proteins. If, if, and if that's so, so yes. what is the rest of our, so what is that, uh, ah, what sort yes. of ratio are we talking about? And what is all the rest of our genome? Well, let's see. Um, retroviruses are about 8%. Uh, about um, 3% are other DNA transposable elements that have come from who knows where, maybe other viruses. There are, there are duplications of other RNA viruses in our genome. And then uh, about 40% of our genome is comprises things called line elements, long interspersed repetitive elements. And they duplicate themselves by reverse transcription. So a line element is a piece of DNA. It makes RNA. That RNA goes to someplace else on the genome and gets reverse transcribed into DNA and inserted in another place. So now we've got, we've accounted for 50% of the genome, right? The other part, 50% is called dark matter. We really don't know very much about it, but some scientists believe that, that dark matter has comprised other kinds of transposable elements that we haven't yet identified. So there's still a lot of mystery about our own genome. Interesting. And interesting that that's the same sort of use of the term dark matter in astrophysics. Yes. Uh, the dark also is just a placeholder for we don't really understand what it is. You got it. Um, <laughs> very interesting. Um, so there are some well-known retroviruses, um, in particular HIV. Correct. Um, was that a retrovirus you worked on at all, or is there something you can tell me about what's something fascinating oh, yes. about the HIV virus? Oh, yes. yes. So, I, so I told you that uh, uh, I started working on this Rouse sarcoma virus after I uh, switched from uh, bacterial viruses to retroviruses. 
And uh, I studied that for many years. And then, of course, the, the HIV pandemic came along and everyone was interested and we started working on HIV as well. So I've studied both of those, uh, both of those viruses. Uh, my main focus has been on this, uh, on the enzymes that the virus produces, because they have been uh, important uh, targets for antiviral therapy. So I've worked on the, the enzyme uh, protease, is a, uh, an enzyme which cuts down pro the proteins. Uh, there's an enzyme, of course, the reverse transcription that makes uh, DNA from RNA. And then there's that wonderful enzyme that does the insertion thing, the integrase. It takes that DNA and sticks it into the, into the genome of its host cell. So I've been studying all of those three, um, and uh, it's, it's been fascinating. So you've been studying virology for decades. It seems like all of a sudden, uh, this field that you've appreciated and been fascinated by for decades is suddenly a very popular field with everyone. It's like, it's, we're in a heyday of virology because we're in the midst of a pandemic with the SARS-CoV-2. That's true. I mean, it's just amazing. Even in my neighborhood, people are asking me about this fact about virology and that. So it's it's um, uh, it's it's made its impression on everybody, unfortunately, in a very sad way. Yes. And so the SARS-CoV-2, this new novel coronavirus, it's not a retrovirus. Tell me something about uh, this virus and Maybe is is there something that you find interesting or, or yes uh, most provocative about it? Well, yes, this is not uh, it's not a retrovirus, but it is an RNA virus. So it has its uh, its genome is RNA, and it is unusual. Most most RNA viruses have very small genomes, uh, but this one has a very long genome. It's a uh, uh, really uh, much much larger than most of these viruses. Uh, I, I guess it's about three times, uh, its genome is three times larger than a retrovirus. So it has a very long genome. And uh, the reason people think that it can survive with such a long genome is that it has a special mechanism when it is replicating its genome. So it has a, an RNA dependent polymerase that makes more RNA, makes more of its, itself. It replicates itself. Uh, most RNA polymerases in the smaller RNA viruses um, make a lot of mistakes, and they can't fix the mistakes. So you can't be too long. Uh, you can't have your genome can't be too long because if you make too many mistakes, you're dead. So you can get away with a small genome because you don't make too many mistakes in that small stretch. So here we have this virus with a long genome. Well, the reason it gets away with it is because it has a proofreading enzyme. So it makes, it fixes its mistakes. <laughs> and that's, uh, that's good for it, but bad for us, because we already have uh, antivirals that can attack the uh, polymerization step. Uh, but this virus can fix that fix that those problems right away. So it's a toughie, it's a tough one. And uh, so people are trying to uh, develop antivirals uh, that will inhibit the polymerase activity uh, because that's a, an obvious target, uh, but they have to worry about this proofreading. And how unique is this proofreading gene? Is this common to the other closely related coronaviruses or is it really new? No, it's it's in all of the coronaviruses. Okay. It's uh, it's part of their uh, genetic makeup. It's the reason they can have these long genomes. Now, most DNA viruses, vir viruses that have uh, DNA genomes, if they have a polymerase, they have a proofreading uh, factor in there too. So they can have large genomes, uh, but most of the RNA viruses do not, and that's why they have these small genomes. Uh, so the coronavirus presents a big challenge, and uh, uh, there have some some science scientists have said suggested that uh, perhaps we could find a way to target this proofreading function. 
But that's difficult because uh, we need the proofreading functions in our own cells. So you have to be careful to inactivate the one in the virus and not the one in the cell. So it's, uh, it's really uh, very difficult. We have had some previous epidemics with these other coronaviruses, uh, SARS-1 and, and MERS. Uh, do you know what is different about this one? Um, that especially what made us treat it so differently, like our global response to this virus has been um, more dramatic than than how we handled those previous ones, and also its success in spreading has 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 been more dramatic. Uh, do we know why? Uh, yes, we do. I think we do know why. Um, uh, uh, it does spread very readily. Um, it's apparently infectious, even though people are uh, have no symptoms, so you don't even know you have it. Uh, it's attaches to its, its, its lock and key mechanism is very efficient. So it can infect your cells very, very efficiently. And it makes lots and lots of progeny. It reproduces very, very fast. Uh, SARS-1, the first one, uh, what did not have a, as tight a lock and key mechanism, uh, but it was pretty, pretty fatal. So it, it's, it really, uh, uh, killed people very rapidly, and uh, it it did not have this uh, uh, feature of being um, shed in people who had no symptoms. So this one is is quite a challenge for that for those uh, three reasons. Spreads very rapidly. Uh, is spreads among people who are, don't even know they are infected. Uh, attaches to its receptor very, very rapidly and makes lots and lots of virus. So it's really gone in a couple of months through the whole world. It's just extraordinary. The social distancing that we're practicing, if we did it in a really extreme way, is there a way that we could have done this where we could have cut the virus off entirely? Could we have starved it of new hosts? Why, why does it run its course in an individual? And, uh, and, and could we have interfered with it completely? Um, or would that have been like an unrealistic level of, of social distancing that we would have had to practice? Well, if you could know who was infected, it would certainly work. Because uh, if you would isolate the person who's infected, and it runs its course in that person, and there's no more, there's no more fertile victims around. The virus will just die. Uh, it, you know, it doesn't have any legs or it doesn't fly, so it just will die. But the problem is, you can't identify the victims if you have people who are have no symptoms. So you'd have to be able to test every person all the time, and that's kind of difficult. So. Uh, the social distancing is that getting everybody to stay away from everybody else, of course, has worked uh, for that reason, because you don't have to identify people. Uh, you just assume everybody should isolate themselves and, and infected people will be um, isolated. But of course, that's never perfect. And uh, some people have to move around. Um, and so here we are, limping along. Is it? clear that we, we have done globally here in the United States, I know locally, and then globally, we've implemented pretty extreme shelter in place or social distancing practices. Is it clear that that has had a great effect on uh, decreasing the, oh, yes. the deaths I, and, and illnesses? Oh yes, I, I think it does. The epidemiologists had made predictions based on previous epidemics, that if nothing was done, uh, there would be 200,000 people dead. And now we have 60,000 people dead or something like that. But yes, that difference is, is the people saved from social distancing and staying in place. 
So yes, it has been successful. It's not perfect, as I said, but um, it has done it has done its job as best it could. And there's no question that uh, there has been success there. And places where they could practice that even uh, earlier have been even more successful, like South Korea and other places. So. We're already seeing people clamoring for a loosening of restrictions. And in fact, we are seeing a loosening of restrictions in some states. Um, am I right to be a little scared of this? I fear that, 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 that we haven't contained it yet and that this is going to result in a second wave and maybe a worse wave, which I know previously happened with the flu 100 years ago. Yes, yes. I would predict that that's uh, probably true. And uh, personally, I intend to stay in place. And I think uh, anyone over 60 should think hard about it, uh, if you can. Uh, and I think we're in for a problem unless we get some, my, my first hope would be to get some good drugs. Uh, if we had some good drugs that would uh, catch the virus early on before these terrible immunology responses occur, uh, then it wouldn't be so scary and terrifying and we wouldn't have so many deaths. And, and I think we could, we could solve the problem easily. Right now, there is a promising drug. Uh, it's called remdesivir. And it, it uh, uh, is an antiviral that uh, targets that RNA dependent RNA polymerase that I told you about. It's not 100% effective but it does uh, reduce the length of the, of the disease and uh, apparently also uh, decreases the number of deaths. And I think that's hopeful. I hope that's just the beginning and that we're gonna get more uh, drugs like that, uh, drugs that will target this polymerase and get around this problem of this proofreading uh, function. Uh, and there, and people are working on it. So I'm hopeful. So if we could get an antiviral or even an antibody that would uh, uh, even protect people for several months, for example, that would be uh, a way to mitigate the problem. Uh, vaccines are in the works, and we can only hope that they're successful. But certainly, many people are trying. A couple minutes ago, you mentioned something about the awful immunological response. Yes. Uh, what yes. did you mean by that? Well, this this virus, this disease seems to go in like two phases. An early phase when the virus replicates in your upper respiratory tract and makes lots and lots of virus. And then it gets down, it, and then it, it seems to elicit a very severe immune response. Then it gets down into your lungs and the immune system starts fighting it uh, rapidly. And in the extreme cases, when people really, really get sick, uh, it turns out that uh, it's more, the virus is almost gone or not there as much anymore, but the immune system is still going crazy. It hasn't turned itself off. So uh, that's part of the, part of the problem. So it's, People have been trying to uh, treat the virus early and then treat the immune system by getting immune suppressors later uh, to kind of stamp, stamp down this uh, hyperimmune response that uh, seems to be doing uh, an awful lot of damage in some people. That's fascinating because obviously we need that immune system yeah. to defend against something like this virus, but, right. it, but there's like a sweet spot there's it can't a sweet be too strong. That's correct. It's a sweet. There's a sweet spot. So uh, you can't you can't suppress the immune system early because you want it to there to damp down the amount of virus that you got. But then when it goes crazy in the late thing, that's the sweet spot. That's where where you want to damp it down right there. So it's it's kind of a balance between the two, and it's uh, it's a difficult balance that uh, physicians have been have been trying to way when they treat these very, very sick people who are in ventilators and have other problems. And, and then, of course, the virus seems to be able to attack not only the lungs, but other tissues of the body, because its receptor, the lock, 
that the key fits into, uh, it's found in many tissues of the body, in the lungs, in the kidney, in the heart. Um, so the other people have had other problems that uh, that come from the virus. And then lately, uh, there there is an, a third problem that's uh, very puzzling, uh, that people seem to be selling blood clots, which can be, of course, very serious. They can go to your brain or uh, they can go to your heart. Uh, and that's a big mystery. They don't know whether that's the immune system or some product of the virus or what's causing this blood clot. So uh, that's a big puzzle that has to be solved. It's amazing to me that our, the way our immune system responds to a virus that, that it's never encountered before. It's completely new to us, and yet our body is able to recognize it as a threat and respond with some defensive measures? Uh, yes, it does. It uh, it's, responds very, very rapidly. Uh, much of it is uh, uh, innate and uh, intrinsic response. It sees this, uh, the body sees this as foreign and it starts to, uh, the cells of the body recognizes this as a foreign entity and uh, starts to make uh, cytokines and lymphokines, and uh, they really uh, are very, very powerful. They attract other parts of the immune system, cells of the immune system to the same place, and it's a real battle scene. <laughs> In terms of the antibody, we hear a lot of talk about the antibodies. Do we know yet um, whether if I get infected once, am I protected from being infected a second time? About this virus, uh, it's still unclear. Uh, there is evidence that for the SARS-1 virus that there are protective antibodies so that if you're infected, you have an antibody response that, that gives you immunity to reinfection. So there's hope that this will be similarly uh, uh, a similar response. Uh, but we don't know that yet. Uh, there isn't enough information yet. Uh, people are trying to use, uh, in, in, in cases where uh, there are victims that are in dire straits, uh, they have been treated with something called survivor serum. So people who have survived are thought to have antibodies that would be effective. And they donate their serum to treat. And there have been some uses of survival serum. I'm not sure what the outcome is. Um, so there is hope that there will be uh, an immunity, but we don't know that for sure yet, unfortunately. How does that even work that a previous exposure helps us fight a, a second, uh, a, you know, a subsequent exposure? What What is it that the antibodies do? Like, how does our body if it survives the first one, how is it protected from the next encounter? Uh, well, uh, you make a lot of antibodies and you make a lot of cells that recognize uh, the pathogen in the first place, uh, and they go to work on the, in, the, in the first instance. And among those, uh, there, are, there are a few cells called memory cells. They go and they kind of go to sleep, but they remember. They have seen this thing before, and the body maintains those memory cells so that the next time you see it, the memory cell will encounter it and say, oh, I remember this guy, and it will be woken up, and it will reproduce itself, and in short work, you have a, a whole lot of more antibodies and T cells that will, uh, will uh, attack the pathogen in that second exposure. And are antibodies like what we were describing, are they proteins that that physically interfere with the functions of the virus? There are there are proteins that bind to to particular sites on the virus and that may or may not interfere. Uh, sometimes it'll bind to some place that who cares? Some place sometimes it'll bind to some place that who cares and that's bad because that may help it get into another cell by another part of the antibody. So um, 
what they will be looking for uh, when they're uh, testing vaccines is a, uh, a, a uh, injection or a, 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 an antigen that will elicit what's called neutralizing antibodies. So it's an antibody that when it binds, it does actually neutralize the virus. But, um, but the cell makes, the cells make, uh, the body makes a lot of uh, antibodies and some of them neutralizing and some of them not. Some vaccines that we have, you get a single vaccination and it basically protects you from, for life from that particular uh, virus. Uh, others, you might need a booster. And then we have something like the flu that we live with that, why, if I get a flu shot, if I get vaccinated for the flu, why does that not necessarily protect me from the flu that season? Because the next season you'll have a different flu. Uh, the flu is a virus that can uh, change uh, by something called reassortment. So uh, you have a flu strains that exchange different parts of their genome all the time. So the next time you'll get a flu that uh, you haven't seen before, they'll ha it'll have a proteins that you haven't seen before. Uh, so f flu is unique in that way. Uh, fortunately, the coronavirus uh, doesn't do this reassortment very well. It doesn't have little bits of genome that can exchange or reassort, uh, and it doesn't seem to uh, mutagen mutagenize very well because it has this uh, uh, correcting function, right? So ah, we're, okay. So that... there is a so there is a hope that we're not going to if once we've got a a, a vaccine to it. Uh, we will be able to, our body will recognize it the next time because it, it does not change that much. But of course, there are something like 500 different coronaviruses in bats. So we don't know if uh, there's another one that's gonna come that's gonna be different because uh, the SARS-CoV-1 and the SARS-CoV-2 are both coronaviruses, but they're different enough that immunization to one does not immunize you against the second one. So uh, the virus that exists now, the COVID-2, hasn't changed. So we've get a, if we get a vaccine to it, we will be detected from it, but not another virus that emerged that may emerge sometime later, next year, 10 years from now, who knows? So that's a fascinating thing, you, this, this proofreading. Yes. Uh, Gene, it seems that it helps the virus replicate faithfully. Um, but if it didn't replicate faithfully, those mutations are are sometimes things that lead to new that lead to success. Maybe most yes. often they don't. But most so there's often like they an don't. interesting tension there that it's like you can either replicate faithfully or you can evolve quickly. Correct. Correct, exactly. And it doesn't evolve quickly in, in real time because of this proofreading. That's exactly right. Fascinating. Is there something you wish more people understood about viruses? I wish people didn't get emotional about them, thinking about them as bad things or nasty or uh, they're um, just, just Think of them as just inert particles that you have to avoid somehow. Uh, and um, I think if you if you if you have that kind of concept and don't give them any kind of uh, anthropomorphic uh, traits, uh, I think you can you can feel better about it. But people, I've seen people, for example, I walk outside every once in a while in my neighborhood and we have a big road. So I walk on this side of the road and other people walk on that. And people are walking with masks outside. And I'm thinking that's kind of silly because the virus particles are not gonna reach from here to there 25 feet away. And if even if, if there's viruses, they're gonna be going out, they're not gonna be spread in that kind of environment. So I think if you, if you think about it that way, as, as kind of inert particles uh, that uh, if, you, if you know enough about, you know how to stay away from them, 
but you don't have to be hyper f- fearful about it. I think that would help. Uh, but what about wearing masks, even cotton masks, when we're indoors and in closer contact with people? I think that is that's that's necessary. And you can you can, I mean, I I remember early on they were saying, oh, masks are no good. Don't. I mean, that's absolutely absurd. If masks were no good, why would medical people wear them, right? I mean, it was really kind of I think very bad information that we were given. Um, so masks do help, and uh, they help most if you're infected, because they'll keep the virus in there. So if if you're inf- if you wear a mask and I wear a mask and you're infected, the probability of my getting infect- infected is much much lower, just a percentage maybe. Even but, when we're talking just about not N95 masks, but any t- a bandana or a cotton mask. Correct. Correct. Even so, you and I are kind of three or six feet away. You're a mask and I wear a mask. The probability of my getting infected, even if you're infected, is low. So that's the reason I think everyone should wear a mask. Not to, not to protect yourself, but to protect everybody else. If everybody wore a mask, I think uh, it would be really good. And, and uh, I know they, uh, I go to the supermarket now and everybody has a mask on their face. And it's a, I think it's a good thing. Is there a question or some questions that you most want the answers to? Uh, yes, I would like, uh, I'd like uh, to find out what kind of uh, antiviral can affect this, uh, this, this coronavirus. I'd like to know more about its polymerase and uh, ask whether we could we could make a uh, an antiviral that would recognize any coronavirus polymerase. That would be good for the next epidemic, right? Yeah. Uh, that would be worthwhile. And I'd like to know about this blood vessel problem. This is very mysterious. Why people are getting um, blood clots? Uh, is that a virus phenomenon or something else? It's it's really. So those are the those those are scientific mysteries that I'd like to I'd like to understand. In addition to your textbook, that if someone is a college student, uh, then they may encounter a principles of virology. Um, but you also have this other book, Discovering Retroviruses, uh, which is for uh, who who is discovering retroviruses for? Uh, well. To, to be honest, I wrote Discovering Retroviruses for my children and grandchildren so they would understand what, what I was fascinated by for these last um, five decades, for example. But it's really, uh, I think it's aimed at uh, students, uh, people who are interested in science. And um, I know that it's, uh, it's, it's very short. It's only about 170 pages, and it's very uh, dense. But I think that anybody could understand it if if they worked at it, because I start by by describing genetics, and what a gene is, and what DNA is, and what proteins are, and so forth. So I give the background, and then uh, I focus on how much we've learned with these retroviruses about evolution, about human biology, about disease. Uh, It's just fascinating. It was fascinating to me, and so I wanted to share it. Discovering retroviruses is subtitled Beacons in the Biosphere. Why do you call them beacons in the biosphere? Because studying retroviruses have taught us so much about the biosphere, about evolution, about RNA into DNA, about the er- the er- they are some of the latest, the earliest viruses we know about, um, about our own biology, about diseases like cancer and AIDS, um, and now retroviruses are being used as therapies. So we're we're taking advantage of this feature that it 
it becomes part of our genetic material. And people are taking uh, the genomes of retroviruses like HIV, gutting them of their genes and putting in useful genes and allowing those useful genes to go into our genomes to, to, to correct genetic mistakes. Oh, so, interesting. So like keeping some of the genes of the virus so that it can do its basic functions, but then removing the ones yes. that produce negative consequences. Correct. You've got it. That's You've got it. Yes. So they're called vectors, retroviral vectors. So uh, they are. They keep the, the signals that are needed for integration, and then you put in whatever information you need, you want. And uh, it's a very, very effective way of correcting genetic mistakes. We've had successes so it, with it. What's an example of a success using retroviruses that way? Well, uh, you've heard of this uh, uh, CAR T, uh, this CAR T methods. So uh, people have uh, engineered retroviruses uh, that uh, will go integrate into your T cells and produce an antibody against something that uh, that that is uh, in, that you're in, that's infected with, or an antibody against a cancer cell. And uh, so you take T cells from a person, you infect them with this CAR T. Uh, virus vector, and then you reinfuse the cells into someone's body, and that uh, those T cells will now be programmed to go and attack your cancer cells. So it reprograms. You can reprogram T cells uh, with this vector, and that has been used uh, to treat people effectively. I. I should probably ask you something about vaccines in general, because uh, it's virology and vaccines are a central part. You should of, really of... have you should really have an interview with somebody who's a true immunologist. Mm. You're you're getting here my superficial immunology information. So um, take that under the consideration. <laughs> okay. Well, let me ask you. It's similar to what we just described. Um, for some types of vaccines, um, a virus is also used as a vector? Yes, exactly. Yes. In fact, uh, uh, some of the, some of the uh, strategies for coronavirus vaccine is actually taking uh, a DNA virus called adenovirus and taking out its bad genes or adeno-associated virus, taking it, its bad genes out and uh, inserting uh, the spike protein, that's the protein, the lock, the key protein from the virus into, into that, and then infecting people with that virus. Um, that's, a, that's an approach that's being taken, yes. It's uh, adenovirus and adeno-associated viruses are the two viruses that are being used in that way to make vaccines. Um, there are other approaches. There are other approaches by using um, another another uh, another group uh, is trying to use uh, the pro the uh, vaccinia virus, which is uh, the uh, virus that was used, you know, for smallpox vaccination, and uh, putting this spike protein or proteins from coronavirus into it. If you, what does that mean exactly? If you put the protein, the spike protein into this new uh, vaccine, Yes. what is that, then what, what happens? What happens is you get a, uh, a small a, a infection, a mild infection uh, of the, at, the, at the area of injection. And uh, the cells, the infected cells will, uh, uh, the virus will produce this protein of uh, the coronavirus along with its own, its own uh, proteins, and uh, your immune system will recognize it. So, uh, in a sense, the uh, the vector is kind of uh, 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 a stimulant for uh, for uh, the immune system to recognize uh, the proteins that you want uh, 
to to have a a vaccine to. Okay, so this the virus that we're using as like the vector. Yes. It's 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 uh, been prepared in such a way that it's not going to cause the negative effects that, that's that, right. that SARS CoV two. But right. by but by having the protein that's that spike protein, it does get an antibody response from us. You so bet. it's it's a way to to train our body to defend against that specific protein without it being attached to that specific. Uh, virus, the, the you got SARS -CoV it. <laughs> okay, Un okay. So then we're prepared, and then when if we get infected by SARS CoV two, we're producing antibodies that are going right to block the spike protein. We hope so. Interesting. It is interesting to me that different viruses preferentially affect different parts of the uh, population. Like one virus might affect children more than other segments of the population. And and then we have this SARS-CoV-2, which we see uh, that the proportions are different, that 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 children are less likely to get it. And then seniors, um, what, yes. what are the factors that might affect that sort of thing? The soil, the soil. If you put seed in one kind of soil, it'll grow this way. If you put seed in another kind of soil, it'll grow some places it won't grow at all. It's the soil. Right. So that's it's it's the it's the body. It's the physiology of of uh, of what it's infecting that depends that determines whether it will thrive or not. I think that's the way to look at it. And then and does that mean like the the strength or the nature of the immune response of an Exa individual? Yes. Yes, exactly. Uh, that or. Uh, how many receptors you might have on this on your cell, or if your receptor is a little bit different. Remember, there were some people who, that were resistant to HIV because their receptor had, had a mutation. So it's depending. It depends on a lot of things. It depends on you know, the soil. <laughs> okay, excellent. Knowing what you know about virology and the state of this global pandemic. Um, do you have any cause for optimism or pessimism? How do you how do you feel about how? I don't know if it's right to ask a scientist this this non sciencey question, but how do you feel about um, what might happen in the in the near future? Uh, I feel optimistic, but not in the very near future. Yeah. So I think we're going to get drugs. And I hope we get drugs. I think that's going to be first, um, and uh, maybe even Im maybe immunizing antibodies. And uh, I got my fingers crossed for a vaccine because if they had a vaccine that worked for MERS, which I think they did have, then it should be possible to make a vaccine against this coronavirus as well. Um, so I'm optimistic in the in the longer term, but but in the short term, I think I'm going to start keep wearing my mask. <laughs> and Me too. staying indoors. <laughs> Me too. So thank you very much for taking so much time to talk to me and answering all my questions. Um, it was very informative. I appreciate it. Okay, you're welcome. <laughs>